What what is your take on what Russia's positioning is and what what is what's what is the real issue? Well, as as we said last time, their their stick on it is essentially back in the day when we gave up the old empire. You made a promise to Gorbachev verbally, Jim Baker, that you wouldn't expand NATO. Since then, 12, maybe more countries have joined, all of the ones that were in the old Warsaw Pact. And not content with that, you also brought in the Baltics. You've actively promoted democracy, i.e. made unstable all of the border states around us, Georgia, Azerbaijan, etc., etc., Uh, You brought the Baltics in, you made them NATO members, you give them F-16s to annoy us, etc. And uh, now you're doing the same thing with Ukraine, which literally puts NATO on our doorstep. Now, you have this thing where you keep saying that it's not an anti-Russian alliance. What else could it be? (laughs) I mean, you only expand one way and it stops with us. So their playbook since George in 2008 has been, you can't join, let me get this straight, you can't join NATO if you have contested borders, right? Watch mm-hmm. me contest your borders. Yeah. So that's it. So they're not going to allow Ukraine to join NATO. Now, of course, we're taking the high road on this because talk is cheap. Because on the one hand, we're saying, well, you know, we can't tell a sovereign nation it can't join. Of course it's allowed to. And, you know, all the foreign ministers of NATO have affirmed that there's the right of every sovereign to make this decision. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got the Germans vetoing the Brits flying planes over Germany with uh, weapons for Ukraine. Um, they're completely humstrung because their entire heating bill for the winter depends upon yes. Russian gas exports, yep. right? The Poles are caught in the middle of this going, told you so, right? Uh, it, the whole thing's a total mess. And one thing we know is that the United States is not going to go to war over Ukraine. It's simply not going to happen. Yeah. So, and they will not give them the guarantees they want. And they've upped their ante on the guarantees. They want like Bulgaria to withdraw from the alliance <laughs> yeah, and all yeah, this. Yeah. Never going to happen, right? So they, they will do it. It's just, I think it's just a question of time. I think that they will invade. It's not clear where they stop. I mean, actually going to Kiev, occupying, putting in a puppet government, massive civil repression, hundreds of thousands of deaths. I'm not sure they're really up for that because in the long term, I'm not sure they can hold it. But if mm-hmm. the game is simply keep disputing the borders because that way you can't join NATO, they can do that from now to a thousand Christmases. Well, but don't, I mean, right now they certainly have a lot of leverage on Europe because it's cold. Do you, do they have the same leverage in the summer? I mean, do they have a small window of time to actually act on their threats? I mean, I think that the, t- the seasonality of this is what is interesting to me. Well, it's, the other one, there was, it's not as if the Germans are actually going to turn around the other way in the summer and go, oh, now we really are going to back <laughs> yeah. it. And, you know, that's not it. Uh, I read something recently this week where someone said a, a sort of phrase at the German foreign ministry is, uh, our nearest neighbor is Poland and the nearest city is Moscow. Oh, geez. So they're not looking west, they're looking east. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the other thing, it's not just heating. I mean, you know, what, is, what, what does Germany make? They make lots of things with steel. How do you make yeah. steel? You burn gas. Yeah. You do that in the summer as well. Well, and the Kazakhstan thing as well, which I kind of understand, is also, is also playing out. So you get the sense, I mean, of that getting the band back together again in yeah. that... You know, that Russia, I mean, Kazakhstan is in is in disarray over fuel prices. And so who do they call in? But they call in the Russians. I mean, it's it's I mean, all of these different pieces sort of, you know, floating around and like, what is it necessarily? What does it add up to? It seems to just be playing their way. I mean, you have this big strategic realignment between China and Russia, both who have an interest in basically no longer relying on the dollar for clearance of their transactions and essentially getting freedom away, you know, getting away from control of the United States, etc., um, and then you also have these peripheral regimes that were very high yeah. on sort of, you know, redistributing down until the cronies that run them discovered it's much more fun to redistribute up. Yeah. And yeah. eventually that becomes fragile. They fall over and then they call in the Russians for support, at which point the Russians are like, we're back. So, yeah. you know, Belarus went that way. Kazakhstan's gone that way. It's, you know, it's less getting the band back together than sort of like drunk band members stagger through the door of the van and de facto the bank, you know, the band is back together again. You know, you forget that in the 90s under Yeltsin, there was a moment like the Scorpions winds of change, right? Like yeah. democracy was spreading and like Russia could have been brought in and 
that didn't happen. Yeah, and no, they absolutely so, didn't. Yeah. And, you know, from the Russian yeah. point of view, instead of which we, they followed American economic advice and 40% of GDP disappeared in five years. Yeah. They created a class of oligarchs that stole the state that were only tamed by Putin. And yeah. they've had a modicum yeah. of stability and growth since that point in time under his regime, which is why they keep voting for him. Yep. So, yeah. you know, the local on the ground view is very, very different from the chattering classes in the West talking about it. Rich chattering class who owns their penthouse in Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. 